Hi, I'm Anjali Alapath, the host of Arcs, a series about literary inspiration. I have loved fantasy and sci-fi for as long as I can remember. In these strange times, these stories are a wonderful form of escape. Doorways to different worlds, offering glimpses into possible futures. In this first series, I'm going to be talking to six celebrated writers of speculative fiction from South Asia to find out what really made them want to tell stories. We're going to talk about books, TV shows, radio dramas, podcasts, and movies that shaped and influenced them as writers. Today, we're in conversation with S.B. Divya, author, editor, and engineer, with an encyclopedic knowledge of sci-fi and speculative fiction. Divya's work is a fascinating mix of her professional and personal backgrounds, with great science and even better storylines. Her debut novella, Runtime, was nominated for a Nebula Award, and her first novel, Machinehood, also received Hugo and Nebula nominations. She has been recognized for her work on the Escape Pod. Her short fiction has been published in a variety of magazines and anthologies. Hi, Divya. Thanks for joining us today on Arc. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know you've been super busy. Congratulations on the Nebula nomination, by the way. Oh, thank you. To kick things off, I just wanted to ask you a bit about your journey as a writer. And did you always want to be one or is that something you kind of stumbled into? I have wanted to be a science fiction author since I was 13, but I took a long hiatus in the middle because around that same age, I also decided I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Neither of those things happened as I planned, <laughs> as life does. But no, I went off to college to do science and then engineering and ended up majoring in computational neuroscience finally. And then I was really focused on that aspect of my career. Writing was kind of a fun pastime, but didn't really seem like a way to make a living. It's a really hard way to pay your bills, for sure. Most writers I know start out with some other way of having a stable income and then build up their writing. And I would occasionally start a short story on a vacation or something. But I was telling myself that it was something I would do when I retired from engineering. And after having a child and a few years of just having my life consumed by, you know, kid, house, work, I kind of decided to to take writing back up as a way to carve out a little bit of space for myself. And I decided that this time, being, you know, in the middle of my life and having accomplished a decent amount in my first career, that I would actually try to get published and not just write for my own sake. And that kind of started me on this whole journey back in 2013 of submitting short fiction and then working my way into longer form. And you mentioned engineering, and which I think really shows in your work. How is that kind of tied into your writing and your storytelling in general? Well, it's been an interesting feedback cycle because I started reading and loving science fiction when I was even younger, when I was nine or ten. And that definitely kindled an interest in science and technology. And so I think it kind of came full circle in that, you know, when I started writing, I knew I wanted to write science fiction. I do occasionally write uh, fantasy, usually, you know, magical realism, slipstream types of stories. But science fiction is definitely my first love. And it's great to be able to draw on my background because I actually did start as a physics major. I took astronomy and then in order to do computational neuroscience, I had to do biology and engineering. So it's a fairly broad background that I come from. And I think that allows me to be comfortable delving into technical details. I love that I get to research, especially these days with you know, so many papers being available on the internet, it's easy to get deep into a subject if you want to. And I really enjoy having that freedom to kind of explore whatever I'm finding interesting on that particular week. 
you also worked on the escape podcast which is by the way fantastic anyone who's listening please go listen to that so how did your work there affect your storytelling you know, i started submitting stories in 2013 and i was very lucky to get one accepted and published in 2014 And my first publication was at a site called Daily Science Fiction and they're still going. It's like one flash fiction piece which is, you know, three or four pages each day. I had been reading Daily Science Fiction for a while just to kind of get the rhythm of flash fiction and understand that um mode of storytelling. And someone on there had mentioned that their story had partially been inspired by a prompt from the Codex Writers Group. So after I saw that I looked into it and I was like, oh, it's, it's a really cool site for newly published authors. And so once I had my first publication, I joined Codex. And through one of these fun story prompt contests that they have, I met many many other writers one of whom was at that time with escape pod and she's the one who then brought me in as a slush reader or associate editor is what we call them officially but they read submissions it wasn't something i particularly sought out but i had heard that being a submissions reader especially if you write a lot of short fiction can be a great way to learn more about the craft and so i said yes and that's kind of how it it all started so i would say that first year of reading submissions was probably the most educational in terms of learning my own craft but beyond that especially once i moved into the upper editorial roles it's given me a lot of perspective on rejections which you know are part and parcel of being a writer and really understanding what it's like to be an editor really understanding what a responsibility it is especially this past decade i would say all of publishing in the US has gone through an awakening much like the rest of the society in terms of increasing the types of voices who are represented in stories but also who are represented as authors and in the world of publishing and so having that kind of power i felt was definitely a responsibility and a privilege and so it was awesome to kind of think of ways that i could contribute positively to expanding the genre to expanding what we bring to our audience so your work is largely like you said in the sci-fi space so was there any particular media so a book a movie or a tv show that really inspired your writing and storytelling what inspired me to get into science fiction in the first place was a little book that my school librarian gave to me called the green book it's not super famous by Jill Patton Walsh but it had a really amazing twist ending that kind of blew my little 10 year old mind and I just never stopped reading science fiction after that. I, you know, I would read other things on occasion, but that's kind of where I always went back to because it it engaged my imagination so much. But in terms of writing, I first got inspired as a writer is during a class assignment in my 8th grade. I think we had to write a full short story in like half an hour, which apparently it was impossible for my brain so i wrote something and then we exchanged it with a partner at our desk and read each other's work and critiqued it and i had left mine on like this cool ambiguous ending where you don't know what happens to the character and and my friend read it and she gave it back to me and she's like this is not a complete story this is just a beginning <laughs> you have to write the rest of this cuz i want to know what happens and that kind of kicked off my journey into writing short fiction because I was like I have a reader somebody wants to know what happens next so I have to write it because nobody else is going to and so I wrote you know several chapters of this science fiction story which eventually fizzled out because I didn't know what happened next <laughs> but I kind of kept at it here and there during my teens you know writing short stories 
considering submitting to magazines, but never quite walking up the nerve to do so up until I went to college. But I would say the formative books of those years in my life and the formative authors really were Frank Herbert, CJ Cherry, and Joan D. Binge. I loved them for their big ideas. I loved CJ Cherry, especially for her prose and the style of writing. And so I suspect that those have influenced me at a subconscious level in terms of my style and also the kind of science fiction I tend to write, which is you know, very heavily into big ideas, into exploring big questions and having all of that delivered through the medium of strong characters. I did read The Green Book. The ending really got me. And also, I hadn't read a lot of sci-fi, which was geared towards kids, because I discovered sci-fi in college. And it wasn't something that I found at the local library that much. So it kind of blew my mind that there was stuff out there at that time for kids. What about The Green Book in particular kind of struck a chord with you, other than the ending? So I went into that whole situation of getting a science fiction book from my school librarian because my dad had been bugging me to read at a higher level than I was at that age. He's like, you're too old for these little kids books. Like you need to expand your horizons. And one of his colleagues suggested that I might like science fiction. So he, you know, just got on my case, try science fiction, try science fiction. So it's like, okay. I will try science fiction and I will prove to you how much I don't like aliens and little green men on the moon or whatever. And so I went to the library and I asked her, this was the book she handed me. And it's not about aliens. It's not about time travel. It's not even, you know, Star Wars lightsabers. And that I actually did like Star Wars at the time. But instead, it is a very strongly character focused story. It was about a little girl, you know, about similar age to me, who was having to abandon the earth. And it was really something I related to. And it was also, I think, just so grounded. And I hadn't realized that science fiction could be so realistic, you know, that this is a thing that could happen in my lifetime, but it's being written about as a story. And so I think that's a lot of what also captured me. Though, admittedly, the next series that I ended up really loving at that age was also, again, about a young woman, but on a different planet with, I think, with like a robotic AI caretaker. And she's the only one on this planet. And she's not, she's like bioengineered a little bit to survive on this planet that's a little bit hostile to human beings. And that is an idea I still love. That's actually an idea I'm working with in my latest novel that, you know, biotech and bioengineering go hand in hand with space travel and space exploration. And it's interesting, you were saying that you didn't realize there was science fiction aimed at children. And a lot of people don't. I think a lot of people think more of fantasy when it comes to kids. If you look today on the shelves for middle grade, it is dominated by fantasy. But I'm talking about the 1980s here. And I think, you know, even going back further, for a long time, science fiction dominated the genre space. And so people were absolutely writing science fiction for kids and more importantly, for girls. Because that's the other thing a lot of people, you know, they have this misconception and they think about the ABC, right? Asimov, Bradbury, Clark, like these are the, the big names that most people in the world still think of when you say science fiction literature. But there were people, people like Jill Patton Walsh and Joan Binge and, you know, going all the way back to the 1920s and 30s, there have been women people of color writing science fiction for all ages and set in all parts of the world. And I wish more people realize that. And I think it's weird because for me, I knew it because that's, that was my experience 
growing up. And I didn't find out until much more recently how unique an experience that really was reading female author science fiction with girl protagonists. <laughs> it, it's sad to say, but that's what I sought out and I found plenty of it. And I think it's just kind of unfortunately fallen by the wayside and people have embraced this narrative that it doesn't exist when it really always has. And I think there's like a very strong kind of a family theme in Green Book, which I think it's interesting because I see that in Machinehood as well, which to me is a little unusual because I don't always see that angle in sci-fi. A lot of the times I feel it's kind of a lone narrative in some ways. And it was really interesting to me that you put so much emphasis on these connections especially in Machinehood, it's sister-in-laws as well, which is kind of an unexplored angle to me, especially from a Desi background. Yeah, I have made that choice pretty consciously in a lot of my stories because I was having some conversations early on as a writer with other writers in this space about how the American independent actor narrative has dominated science fiction. At least in fantasy, you know, you have your group, your traveling party, right? So often it's an ensemble. Even if there's one hero, there's people along with the hero in their journey. Science fiction often tends to be about, you know, that one person, I think, especially because space travel has often in reality, been very isolating. And so, and I think even before that in America, right, like the Wild West and that rugged, you know, self-reliant individual who can just go it on their own, they don't need anybody. And it's a, not only, I think, does it end up being a little bit toxic after a while, but it doesn't fit for a lot of us, especially those of us coming from non-American cultural backgrounds where we really value family and that's kind of the bedrock and foundation that we build our lives on. And so I did want to tell stories where the heroes have strong bonds and it's not just found family on a starship because you didn't fit with your biological family. I think I've explored a lot of different types of relationships, including, you know, siblings, romantic partners, parents and children. And I just thought that was kind of an interesting angle in which to be able to tell the stories of two very different women, but who still share some values in common. And I think it also makes the story more interesting because you have, you know, all the world spanning action of the machine hood in the foreground. And then you have all of the family drama and dynamics in the background, but the two can play off of each other. So I wanted to ask you to do a short reading from Machine Hood, and then I thought after we could discuss the book a bit more. I'm going to read from chapter four of Machine Hood which starts off Nithya's story. So there's two main characters, Olga Ramirez, nicknamed Welga, and Nithya Balachandran, who are sisters-in-law. And the first three chapters all focus on Welga, who's our action hero, and who has experienced the first terrorist attack by the machine hood towards the end of chapter three. So that's kind of where we're coming into things with chapter four. Chapter 4. Nithya. We built software that passed the basic Turing test nearly a hundred years ago. We have weak AIs that speak of themselves in the first person. Bots that can navigate from a charging station to their place of work. And yet nobody thinks wise or bots are sentient. We're still waiting for an AI to stand up for itself, to say, I think, therefore I am. Give me liberty or give me death. We look for a desire for self-determination as proof of sentience. 
No one has successfully programmed an AI to behave this way in a convincing fashion. But I believe we're very close, within a decade at most, to seeing this. Min Wu, PhD, Computational Philosophy. Lectures on the Artificial Mind. Expert Rating, 97.8 out of 100. UC Berkeley, October 2087. Nithya's fingertips moved through the virtual desktop of her office space, opening research results from Asia Pacific's International Medical Journal, adjusting the metabolic parameters in her simulation, pulling in an updated code block from her current contract holder, Synaxel Technologies. They funded designs for pills, the tiny biomechanical machines that could affect everything from intracellular transport to DNA and RNA editing. She had worked on multiple projects for them, primarily with Juvers for muscle recovery and repair. A triple dose of flow kept Nithya's mind from losing the multiple threads of thought. Her agent, Sita, worked on the background task that Nithya assigned her. Sita wasn't the most expensive weak AI design, but she could handle information sorting. Nithya usually had her agents sift through a steady stream of simulation data from other corporations and freelancers, only bringing items of interest to her attention. At the moment, she'd set Sita to trawl for reports that might relate to her sister-in-law's data. Welga's records made little sense to her. The tremors implied a neuromuscular problem, and that pointed to Zips as the likely culprit. But why now? What had built up after a decade of use? Or was her sister-in-law's condition something genetic, and age the trigger? Neurology lay outside Nithya's expertise, but she could muddle through high-level research. If she made enough headway, she might even earn some tips for the work. God knew they needed the extra income. Luis used to earn the bulk of his money from context-tagging gigs marking up visual media with labels that made sense to AIs. But those opportunities had dropped in recent years as Wise became better at interpreting human body language. He took any other work he could find, and he still got decent tips from rocket launches, especially after Ekoyi Station declared independence from India and China's joint governance. With five sovereign space stations and half a dozen others, the population in space had grown to several thousand. They needed supplies, trash removal, and passenger transports. Private rocketry clubs like Luis's could provide those, but the tips didn't amount to much. Certainly not enough to save up for Karma's gear. What a world they lived in where good schooling required network jewels for children. On top of all that, Nithya's period was two days late probably due to stress, but it fed her anxiety. They couldn't afford for her to be pill-free and out of work for a year, not now. There are multiple reports of attacks by a new protest group, Sita announced. Casualties include flagged family member Olga Ramirez. It took Nithya a second to recall that Olga was Volga. Luis had mispronounced his elder sister's name as a toddler, and the ridiculous nickname had stuck. Nithya shifted her focus from her visual to her husband, who sat by the balcony, a disassembled bot at his side. His jaw had gone slack, his gaze blanked to his visual. No doubt his agent had already alerted him. She stood and peered around the soundproof wall that separated her work alcove from her daughter's. An assortment of colorful blocks sat on Karma's desk, next to something that looked like a pyramid built by Gaudi. Karma pointed her haptic feedback gloves at the structure as her lips formed silent words. Virtuality goggles covered half her face. Nithya used parental controls to check Karma's feeds. All school-related. Thank God they hadn't interrupted the children with the news. She expanded some live feeds from the site of Walga's injury and watched a medical team break through the floor of a hotel room. Are you seeing this? 
Louise sent via silent text? Yes, Nithya replied. They usually avoided speaking to each other or Karma during the school day, except for breaks. But Nithya felt extra grateful for the discretion now. She couldn't suppress her gasp as new microdrone feeds showed the extent of the explosion and Welga's burned body. Experts weighed in before the medical team made an official report. Welga ought to live. Same with her partner, Connor, and a third member, someone new. A minute later, the alerts roared to life again with the confirmation of Briella Jackson's death and Jason Kwan's. Alexander Ortega, too. Three of the world's wealthiest people brutally murdered by assailants who then explosively killed themselves. Nithya sent Luis another message. They killed the funders. What kind of madness is this? Horrible, her husband replied. But I'm sure they'll be caught. No one gets away with murder on camera. Rumors flew of a sentient artificial intelligence and the world's first lifelike androids. The machine hood's wide cast threat glared from the lower right of Nithya's visual. Blessings from the machine hood. Seize all pill and drug production by March 19, or we will make it happen. A new era awaits humankind. She expanded the smaller text below it. The time has come to end the distinction between organic and inorganic intelligence. All of us are intelligent machines. All of us deserve the rights of personhood. We appeal to the rest of humankind to follow these principles. And while we prefer a peaceful transfer of power, history proves that human beings will not relinquish their ownership of other intelligences. We believe that the rights of machinehood can only be taken by force. We hereby declare our intention to ensure our rights by any and all means necessary. Humans of this universe, you have a choice. Stand with the machinehood or render yourselves extinct. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. And I have so many questions because I think this is such an interesting and complex book and you've touched on so many themes. And I think what really struck me first was the complete lack of privacy and how accepting people were of it. In fact, you've kind of shown this surveillance as something that's not bad, it's kind of as shades of gray. There's a lot of pros to it. And also the relationship with the lack of privacy is kind of evolves through the book. So what made you think of it in that way? That was an intersection of what I've observed happening in real life with social media and erosion of people's desire for privacy in a lot of spaces, the willingness to share very personal parts of their lives online, especially when they can get paid for it. And so that's where, you know, this tip jar idea came in uh, from Machine Hood. And it also intersected with what I've seen of protests of police and government malfeasance, as we've seen, I think, throughout the world now that people can record videos of wrongdoing by the government. And that kind of transparency, which then gets spread around, can promote social change, often for the better, hopefully. And so I started thinking, well, what if it wasn't just the government surveilling the people? What if the people also get to surveil the government in turn? You know, if everything is open, to everyone all the time. What are the costs and benefits of that kind of situation? And there is such a classic science fiction -y thing, right? If, what if this were true? Then what? You know, then how does society change? How do we change as individuals? 
And I always like to look at the pluses and minuses of technology. I think especially because I've worked in it, it's hard for me to see technology as purely evil. I can't vilify it because we've had so much benefit from it. But at the same time, it can be used for terrible things. And it can be abused without us even realizing it. That I think is a lot of what's happened with social media in terms of this slow, you know, frog in a pot of water type of boiling situation where little by little, we've given up more and more of our personal lives, our faces, our children's names, streaming, you know, live on Twitch when we're just sitting there working, whatever it is, we've been willing to to do that in order to reap the benefits of it. Like, I wanted to know how to temper chocolate. So I go onto YouTube and lo and behold, I can find people recording really good videos of uh, teaching me how to do these things. So for everything that, you know, we we're giving up, we're also gaining something. Otherwise, I don't think we would give that up in the first place. And in machinehood, I take this, I push this really, really far because the other what if I wanted to explore was what if the morality of 75 years from now and socially accepted behavior is you know pretty different from today. And we've observed this, I think, in the last, you know, many centuries, right? Moral codes, socially acceptable behavior is always changing. If there really is no privacy, would people just come to accept that and be totally fine with having, you know, tiny cameras throughout their house, including the bedroom and the bathroom? Places that today, most people, <laughs> not everyone, but most people still consider to be their most private spaces. But I mean, 150 years ago, and in some cultures, even today, it is considered shameful or obscene for, you know, uh, people to reveal certain body parts. And so why couldn't that also change? And that I knew that was going to challenge a lot of my readers, but I wanted it to be a little bit provocative that way. You almost forget about it because they seem to forget about it. And then at certain point, suddenly you're hit with it again. And you're like, oh gosh, there's a camera watching this woman. And I'm glad to hear you say that because I do feel like a successful science fiction or even fantasy really makes you feel like you've lived in that world. And that, you know, and for me, especially with Machine Head, I wanted it to be realistic. I had that problem, actually, when I was writing it. When I was deep into it, sometimes I'd finish and kind of emerge back into my real world of 2018 or whatever. And and be like, oh, yeah, I don't have a kitchen that's going to cook my meals. And I don't have an agent who in my head who's going to, you know, handle all my appointments for me. <laughs> like, why don't I have these things? That'd be really nice. There's a lot of realism in machinehood, which I found really almost too close to life sometimes. Like the gig economy and the idea that we would, as humanity would start taking all these enhancements to try to match up to AI. And I could see that realistically happening just because of the current situation where you would go to a grocery store and buy your groceries and now you can do it by an app and the app suggests things for you to buy and like it's things that even five years ago you might not have found so instinctive or like it wouldn't have even occurred to you and now it's especially because of the pandemic you're just doing everything. I think we're already in a little bit of that competition cycle. That's definitely what was forefront in my mind when I first conceived this book and started writing it, which was back in 2017. In, in the tech sector and in the field of AI, where I've worked, there's a lot of people talking about if we do get generalized intelligence and highly capable robots, what's left for the human beings to do, right? And as I was researching this, I was looking back at the labor conflicts of the 1920s and 30s, and people were having very similar conversations at that time about factories and moving away from agriculture. Well, if the tractors are going to do all the farm work, what is there for 
human beings to do because 75% of the world was working in the fields growing food. And lo and behold, we have found plenty for human beings to do. And I have no doubt that we will continue to find plenty for human beings to do. And I feel like, you know, even with this pandemic, as you say, uh, the more technology connects us and enables our productivity, the more we're expected to produce instead of less. It's almost like we're trapped in this, you know, cycle of boosting our productivity in order to do more. We're doing more to do more, to do more, to do more. And, and does it ever stop? <laughs> that was another thing I, I really was kind of exploring this idea that the certain proponents of technology always try to sell us on, well, the robots are going to free you from drudgery and you'll have so much leisure time to write poetry and sit on the beach. And it's like, none of us do that with leisure time. And we're all somehow working, you know, 60, 70 hours a week on these startups trying to make money. So that's the sort of capitalist consumerist cycle that I do feel like we are trapped in. And that, you know, even as people worry about AI taking their jobs, other jobs are going to crop up, maybe not ones that they really want to do and not ones that are fulfilling, but you're still going to be busy, maybe even busier than you are today. And it's horribly depressing, I know, <laughs> to think that. And, and that's definitely a lot of reader reaction to it. It's like, oh my God, I don't want this future. And I'm like, okay, great. So what are we going to do to, you know, end up in a different future from this one? Because this definitely feels like a path we're on right now. And something else that you've also kind of explored is very extreme differences in like ideological and philosophical viewpoints. And they're both quite militant, which is interesting because one of the factions is neo-Buddhist, which is quite unusual. I somehow didn't expect religion in a sci-fi book. Yeah, I think that ranks right up there with family in being absent from a lot of science fiction. It's there very explicitly in certain books where they focus on, you know, a religious figure or a religious leader as one of the main characters. But religion as part of everyday life is absent. And I think, again, I think this kind of goes back to the, the early roots of science fiction and a lot of those authors not being terribly religious and therefore envisioning you know, futures in which nobody's religious or nobody really talks about it. And that's not my experience. And I don't realistically think that in 75 years, we are going to have eradicated religion from the face of the earth. And I think a lot of people don't want to eradicate it, frankly. I, like my main character, Walga, am an atheist, but, you know, most of my family is Hindu. And I was kind of raised in a mixed household that way. And a lot of my friends are religious. I think if you're going to write characters who are real three-dimensional people, while it can be easy to ignore religion, in a near future setting on Earth, I think having an entire cast of characters where nobody is religious would be really, really strange and ignores a significant portion of the population and an important aspect of their lives. So nobody in machinehood is, you know, super dogmatic, right? But this thing was kind of interesting because again, I wanted to, with that, I wanted to play with expectations, but I was also thinking about Myanmar and the Rohingya and what I learned that that was an ostensibly Buddhist government committing genocide. And I was just like, how do those things even fit together? Right. And we've seen that with a lot of religions that claim to be peaceful on the one hand, but don't act particularly peaceful on the other hand. So I think that one was just kind of a fun way to, to play with expectations. And again, to kind of say, what if putting India and China together, or you can imagine India and China having joint governance of a space station. But I was like, Geopolitically, things have had some pretty massive shifts over the past 75 years. So what if, in order to counteract the Western superpowers, India and China actually 
banded together and collaborated instead of competing. Like imagine how powerful that could be as a force in the world. And with the right people at the heads of those governments, maybe it could happen. It's like, okay, there's always surprises, you know, in reality. So let's throw in some things that would be really surprising to the reader as well. I'm not going to lie. When I read that, I was like, oh, that could go either really well or really wrong. I also really loved your protagonists because I enjoyed the contrast between them. I liked that one was like a one woman army and the other was a working mom who was quite grounded in like realities of life. In a, and I felt like they were both heroes in very different ways. And what went into that decision to portray them so differently? I really wanted to have that contrast. Again, because so many stories focus on that action hero figure. And I need the action hero because she's the one driving the primary plot. She has to be in the middle of everything. And sometimes you can take a non-action person and, you know, yank them out of domestic life and throw them into the middle of the turmoil. So they're kind of a fish out of water, like learning how to be an action hero, even though they're a quote unquote ordinary person. But I was like, that still doesn't show you how the ordinary person lives in their ordinary life. And one of my favorite TV shows, season one of the show Alias, which is from a while ago. But in that, the main character, Sydney, is this like super badass. And then she comes home. And I forget what her cover story is, but she has a cover story of some other much more mundane job. And she has two like very regular people roommates and she just like hangs out with them. They make breakfast and they talk about the rent or whatever. And I loved that juxtaposition of ordinary life, you know, with like extraordinary events happening. And so that's where Nithya really came into play where I was like, this is a way for me to show what the average person in 2095 is going to live like. Not the action hero, not someone with a lot of power, but just an ordinary, everyday person, but then whose life is also going to be thrown into turmoil by these globe spanning events. How are they going to react? What are they going to do? You know, what kind of suffering and like you said, small acts of heroism are they undertaking? And I think we've seen that with the pandemic that's really been brought home. And that happened well after I finished writing this book. But those little things that everybody can do, just tiny, tiny little things that we're doing every day. But if we're in the middle of a crisis, it feels pretty heroic as human beings. We can see that it doesn't always have to be about fighting the bad guys, so to speak. It can be these just little acts of kindness and stability. I have to tell you, I was obsessed with Alias in high school. All those wigs left like a real impression on me. It was such a good show while it was a good show, as with all things J.J. Abrams. <laughs> Someone else whose storyline I was really fascinated by was Josephine and how she became this kind of, from social reformer to this extremist, I would say kind of cult leader. And this sanctuary that she's created and she's kind of leading these people that these Dakinis who've kind of become the face of what the space colony is. It's all another extreme. And I was just interested in how you conceived her and her journey. So she was born out of some of this research I did in the 1920s. I was looking at labor movements and the rise of unions and you know, everything that was happening there. And there was a lot of civil disobedience, a lot of good people, generally peaceful people who got drawn into fairly violent activities because of the circumstances of the time, because they believed in social revolution, because they wanted change. And they didn't go around shooting people. They went around blowing up bridges and factories as symbols of wrongdoing. And they usually went out of their way to make sure innocent people didn't get hurt, right? They wanted to hit people in the wallets. And 
that kind of got me down this road of how do people become revolutionaries? Everyone starts out as just an ordinary kid somewhere. What turns them to extremism? So I just kind of got interested in that kind of character and wanting to explore that mindset a little bit and show how it might be possible and how you might take that journey along with them. And ultimately, in this book, it's up to the reader to decide, you know, are you going to take sides? And who do you think was right or wrong in their actions? But that's where a lot of that that whole storyline around Josephine came from. It's just, uh, yet again, another family person, right? Who's trying to do the right thing, who sees injustice and goes through some trauma and ends up deciding to change the world. Okay, once you've made that decision, how do you actually go about achieving that? And I love that it's not so black and white as well. She started out with the best of intentions. And I think at the end of it, what is so interesting about the whole thing is that it's two extreme factions having a conversation. There had to be some kind of give, which I think was the masterstroke of the book, is that everybody involved had to give in some way. And I particularly loved how Velga, who was so opposed to the machine herd and so opposed to everything they were doing, actually had to physically and mentally compromise so much of herself. To She's saying that she's doing it to kind of infiltrate them. But at the same time, she doesn't want to die. She wants to live. And I thought that was, that's so human, fascinatingly human. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a tough question. Like, I honestly wrestled with it through the whole book, too. And I remember when we're getting deep into spoilers here. Oops. <laughs> it's okay. You can put a spoiler warning on top. When my agent read the manuscript, she came back to me and she's like, by the end of this, I'm really sympathetic with the machine hood. And I said, yeah. I kind of want you to be sympathetic with them, you know, to a point. And she's like, they're like the bad guys. And I'm like, well, but are they, you know, they did some bad things for sure. All governments do bad things though, everywhere in the world. And some people do bad things who aren't necessarily super bad people, which is not to say there aren't actual bad people out there. There absolutely are. But that grayness and that moral grayness is something that I think is a lot more realistic than just like evil for the sake of evil. I'm never a fan of that. Like everybody has motives for why they're doing what they're doing, even if their motives are just to have more money or whatever. Again, after going through all my research, a lot of these people who do terrible things are doing it from a place where they think they're genuinely benefiting humanity. And so then I was like, what if they they actually are genuinely benefiting humanity. <laughs> Nobody wants to see it. How do you overturn something as deeply entrenched as capitalism, for example, or our labor market? And so having everybody compromise at the end, I think, is a nice outcome. One thing that people sometimes criticize about the book, it's too nice of an ending, and that realistically things might not have gone so well for anybody involved, right? They could have gone much, much, much worse. There could have been a lot more dead people by the end of this book. That was my choice to not have a horrible, tragic ending for all those involved and to say that, okay, maybe we can find a peaceful way out of these types of situations, right? Because that's ultimately what we all hope for, for the future. But like your eighth grade story, you have left it a little open and you've kind of given a little room for maybe things could go well, maybe things could go wrong. You've left them kind of at the precipice of things. Yes. In terms of the big biotechnology transformation and the dakini and the adoption of all that in society, I was thinking if I write a follow-up to Machinehood, I'd probably want to skip ahead like five to 10 years and say, okay, 
what did the world do with that moment and how have things changed or not changed for people? I feel like the thing I often see in real life is there's a lot of talk and angst and unrest, but then you do have to go back to your life and family and work and then nothing changes, right? Or very little changes maybe, but you don't get that big revolution that you often see in literature. And I think that's why we love the concept so much in books, because we can make these massive social shifts in our imagination much more easily than we can in reality. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you if you're working on anything right now and that you'd want to share about, and if there's anything that we can look forward to this year or the next. Yes. In fact, I'm about to announce it on social media, but uh, pre-order links are up for my next novel, which is called Meru. And it is quite a departure from machinehood in that it is far future, departure from both machinehood and runtime, my previous two books, set in the far future, lots of space adventure, but still lots of big, big ideas about consciousness and what we owe to the planets and what it means to be human or not. This book very loosely inspired by the story of Nala and Damenti in the Mahabharata. I wanted to, you know, much like with family stuff, I see a lot of romance in science fiction, except in the movies because there always has to be a romance in the movies. And so I was like, what if I take a plot that's fundamentally a romance, but not so much of a Western romance, you know, an Indian style romance, and then set it a thousand years in the future. (laughs) It's evolved so far from there that I don't expect anyone to recognize the original story in it because I've departed from it in so many ways, which is why I say loosely inspired by. It was a really fun book to write. I wrote it in 2020 in the middle of all the awful stuff happening in the pandemic, which is why I think I had to move away from the near future because reality was just a little too grim at that moment. And so I needed something escapist. And so that's what I wrote. And I had a lot of fun writing it. And I hope people enjoy reading it. It will be out on January 3rd. Hachette India has picked it up. And hopefully they will have it out right around the same time as it hits everywhere else. That's great. I'm really looking forward to it. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us today, Divya. That was an amazing conversation and we were thrilled to have you on us. Thank you so much for having me. Super fun. You can follow Divya on Twitter at Divya Streets. Arcs is a series of The Subverse, the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagining futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice, and culture. Follow us on social media at Dark and Light Zine or at darkandlight.com for episode details and show notes.